Okay, welcome back everybody. So today we're going to look at something in a bit more detail that we have actually touched on before uh, during the uh, limits to forward flight. Uh, like I say, we only just touched on it very briefly. So today we're going to look in a bit more detail so you understand exactly why it happens. Um, and if you can understand that, you'll see uh, how actually quite prevalent it is in uh, forward flight, not necessarily just at high speeds and how it can actually have uh, secondary effects uh, during manoeuvres that you might not have realised before. Okay, so we're going to start with a um, helicopter disc looking down from the top, and we've got a anti-clockwise uh, rotating disc. So uh, moving forwards in forward flight in this particular instance, um, so up on the page, and so this is now our advancing blade and this is our a retreating blade here. So before we go much further, we just need to establish uh, one obvious point here that we've touched on many times before. And that is when we are in forward flight, we are creating a uh, airflow over the disc and therefore over each blade. Um, and if we take the advancing blade here, we're creating an airflow which is moving in this direction. So from top to bottom here um, on the page. And the oncoming airflow, which we are creating, therefore, by moving the aircraft forward, can then therefore be added to that. So we're getting the oncoming airflow and the rotational airflow that we're creating by moving the blades around the circle. The retreating blade, however, we're creating a rotational airflow, which is going this way, which means that the oncoming airflow, due to the forward movement of the helicopter, is counteracting that. The so what from that? is that the velocity of the air over the blade on the advancing side is much faster than the velocity of the air over the retreating side. So what does that mean with regards to lift? We can see that we've got a much higher velocity, which means that our dynamic pressure, which is this element here, is much higher. Uh, considerably higher, obviously, because we're actually squaring the velocity of the airflow. On this side, though, on the retreating side, we've got much lower velocity, which means that the dynamic pressure on that side is much lower. So if we leave things as they are, what we're going to end up with is a massive uh, dissymmetry of lift on the retreating blade, on the retreating blade sorry, in comparison to the advancing blade. So what we need to do here in some way in order to sort of balance it out is we need to um, increase the lift. Now we can't change the surface area of the blade because each of the blades has the same surface area. We can't do anything about that clearly. Um, but the only thing we can do is we can change this element, so the coefficient of lift on each side. So how do we do that? So if you haven't seen uh, this graph before, uh, this is a bog standard, very simplified coefficient of lift curve. So we've got the coefficient of lift, um, which is proportional essentially in this particular case for the majority of the time to the angle of attack. And as you can see here, as the angle of attack is increased, much like on an aeroplane, uh, aerofoil as well as a helicopter, as you increase the angle of attack of an aerofoil, we get a gradual increase in coefficient lift. And it's broadly linear, um, depending on the aerofoil you've got. Um, and then it starts to tail off towards the top um, until we hit what's known as our critical, critical angle of attack. And at that critical angle of attack, as you know, with an aeroplane and a helicopter blade, the air becomes turbulent, starts to break away on the back of the aerofoil, and then we end up with a stall condition. So this is when the, the blade in this particular instance is stall. So we know uh, that what we can do here uh, in order to increase the coefficient of lift is to increase the pitch on the retreating side. And conversely, we can help level it out even more by reducing the pitch uh, on the advancing side, which will therefore reduce the coefficient of lift as well. So let's look at what that looks like. Okay, so two uh, points to note here. First of all, here is our aerofoil. And what I'm gonna use is this as the 
cross section of the entire blade. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because most blades, just much, much like most aeroplanes, will have an element of washout built into them. And what that means is that the root, in particular on a helicopter, the root obviously is moving much slower in terms of its linear velocity. It's got the same angular velocity because it's spinning at the same revolutions per minute, but its linear velocity is much lower than the tip simply because it's traveling at a much smaller distance. The circumference here, for example, is much uh, smaller than it is out here. So because it's moving a smaller distance, uh, it's therefore traveling much slower. So we end up in a similar situation as this, where we need to create a uh, higher amount of lift um, using the coefficient of lift and the angle of attack uh, in order to sort of give a slightly more balanced distribution of lift over the top of the blade. So what they do in aeroplanes and also in, in rotor blades for slightly different reasons is uh, we end up with a little bit more pitch built into the blade at the root than there is at the tip. So arbitrary figures, there might be one degree of pitch when you've got fully collective down um, at the root, whereas there'll be zero degrees of pitch at, over at the tip. Now, you'll notice that I'm just using one single cross section. And the reason why is I'm gonna discount the washout here because the pitch angles we're talking about are so large that the tiny amount of washout that you actually include in the blade there is gonna be relatively negligible once we get up to these sort of speeds or once we get into the situation we're gonna be describing here for the retreating blade storm. So that's the first thing with washout. The second thing, as we've already alluded to, um, is that we've got a rotational airspeed, which is much lower down at the root. So we'll use the rotational airspeed approximately this point as our um, uh, airspeed down at the root and then up here this is the rotational airspeed over at the tip so we can see at the moment if this is our airspeed and this is our cord line the angle of attack down at the root is exactly the same as the angle of attack up at the tip so we don't really have any real differences in the amount of lift, technically speaking, or coefficient of lift anyway, that we're producing at each end. Um, however, there is a slight complication there. Despite all the uh, wonderful um, chat about translational lift and removing induced flow uh, or reducing it, um, the reality is with a helicopter, which is basically just a big hairdryer blowing air downwards, is you never actually remove the induced flow. There's always an element of it. It will go up and down, but there'll always be an element of induced flow. And actually in the situation that we're talking about here, where we're moving a helicopter um, quite high speed um, into wind, in order to do that, we need to pitch the disc over. So if we take this as the disc um, in order to move in this direction, we essentially need to tilt the disc in that direction in order to create a horizontal vector which drags the aircraft forwards and because we're doing that we're essentially opening up the profile of the disc to the oncoming airflow and we're creating even more of a profile for the airflow just to go straight through um, almost vertical in relation to the actual disc itself. So what from that is that we have induced flow and the induced flow actually is going to increase the faster we go and this is more, more apparent once you get above endurance speed um, but the induced flow here, what we'll take is as equal across the disc and we'll just simplify things. So equal across the disc, induced flow, which means induced flow at the root is the same as at the tip. So instantly you can see where the problem lies. If we draw the relative airflow now at the root, we have a relatively small angle of attack. If we draw the uh, relative airflow at the tip, however, because of that induced flow, we've got a markedly shallower relative airflow, which creates a much larger angle of attack. So we can see that the coefficient of lift is going to be much higher towards the tip than it is in comparison to the coefficient of lift at the root. So what does this mean? Well, quite simply, as we go faster, the dynamic pressure on the retreating side is going to come further and further down which means in order to balance the lift, we're going to increase the coefficient of lift more and more, 
which means we're going to increase the angle of attack more and more. And as we move up the angle of attack, we're going to move up the coefficient of lift until eventually we hit that critical angle of attack. As soon as we do that, we fall off the other side and we start to stall the blade. And this is exactly what happens when we get retreating blade stall. It can happen at all sorts of different times and in different situations, but it essentially happens because we continually have to increase the pitch on the retreating side blade until we reach the critical angle of attack at the tip initially. Um, and at that point it stalls. So what's the effect going to be like for somebody flying the aircraft? Well, the point to know here is that when the blade stalls, what we find is the, the lift is lost, and therefore if we've lost lift on the blade, it's going to drop. And unlike in the situation with flapping to equality, where when the blade flaps down, it creates a rate of descent flow, which counteracts that induced flow and therefore increases the angle of attack again. If we've got a stalled tip, if we then decrease the induced flow further, well, all we're going to do is further stall the tip. And in actual fact, we'll probably just create a new stall further inboard uh, towards the root. So the flapping down, which is um, a sort of byproduct or, or caused by the loss of lift, actually further exacerbates the problem. So the sort of thing we're going to notice as uh, pilots when we get this is going to be sort of pretty rough control actions really. The thing's gonna to start to sort of bump and just generally feel not particularly smooth. Uh, you might even feel a bit of feedback in the uh, controls themselves. The blade therefore is gonna lose lift and flap down and then stall further. And also because of uh, the precession that we end up with, not, not um, gyroscopic procession, but because of the latency and the flap down, we're going to get a flapping down on the retreating side, which is going to be its max rate, but it means it's going to continue to flap down all the way around to the rear. So what we're going to find is that we're going to get a roll to the retreating side. And also because it's continu continuing to flap down towards the rear, we're also going to get a flap back. So none of the sort of things that you really want when you're traveling at relatively high speeds, for example. So how can we get ourselves out of this situation? Well, quite clearly here, what we've got is a problem with the pitch on the blade, which is causing a stall. So the first action is gonna to be to reduce the power. And with that also, the other thing that's causing the problem is that decrease in dynamic pressure. So we're gonna to have to reduce the speed. And that should find you coming out of the other side into a slightly more stable element of flight. But how do we get there in the first place? And this is quite, um, quite important to understand really, so that when you're preparing to go for a sortie or you're preparing to do some kind of exercise, um, you actually have a bit of awareness of, of the sort of hazards that might actually occur. So the first one quite clearly is high speed flight. But we've already seen that the high speed flight is part of the problem, but it's the increased coefficient of lift also, which is causing the problem. So we might not have particularly high speed, but we might have high coefficient of lift. So when would we have that? Well, the answer is when we need it. So when we are requiring high power settings. So when would we have that? High all up mass. If you're traveling with, um, uh, stores on board or you're traveling with passengers and you've got quite a lot of weight well in order to get off the ground in the first place you're going to need to pull quite a lot of pitch get quite a high coefficient of lift on both the advancing and the retreating uh, blade uh, before you even get going so once you've started moving in forward flight you won't need to be very fast before you realize that you're already quite high up this curve so high oil mass is one the other time you might need to pull up quite a bit of pitch is when there is not a lot of air to bite into. So high density altitudes, any time when the air is less dense, you will find that the coefficient of lift will be higher in order 
or the angle of attack will be higher in order to achieve that higher coefficient of lift. So the last thing just to top and tail uh, the retreating blade stall is just to understand how it can get worse. So we've already talked about the fact that it's the tip that we see this issue, and therefore that's when we're gonna get an element of flap down, um, maybe a little bit of a roll to the uh, retreating side and, and some flap back. But the important thing to note here is that it is at the tip, and essentially it's as soon as this tip starts to move round onto uh, the retreating side and starts to experience some airflow from the rear, we're quite possibly going to start experiencing those negative effects. So it's going to start stalling around about here quite possibly, depending on how fast you're gonna go on. And then the more we start to open the profile of that blade up to the oncoming air, the less rotational airspeed we're gonna get over the rest of the blade. So we'll end up with a little bit more of this blade over this side starting to stall. And what we find is that we can end up, depending on the speed, something looking a little bit like this um, in terms of stalled area. And clearly, as we continue to push the aircraft and we continue to allow that blade to flap down and create a rate of descent flow on the uh, tip or throughout the, the edge of the blade here, the more and more of the blade is going to approach that critical angle of attack. So we can see ourselves getting to a very critical point where the entire side of the retreating blade stall could theoretically be stalled at which point the aircraft would become almost uncontrollable, um, rolling to the retreating side, flapping back, um, and it, it, you could put yourself into a position where it's, it's too late. So high-risk areas are definitely going to be these three, but also not recognising the fault uh, and not applying the correct um, corrective action uh, in order to remove these effects. Well, that's pretty much about it, retreating blade stall, um, and we'll, we'll be looking further at retreating blade stall in the next lesson. I hope it's been useful. As always, any uh, issues, complaints, amendments, uh, or questions, please feel free to put them in the bottom. Thanks a lot.